So we're starting a new chapel series, and we're going to ask some questions, and we're going to try to seek answers to some of life's tough questions. If you're like me, you have questions. I have tons of questions right now. I've had tons of questions my entire life, and one of the reasons why I'm a Christian is because Christianity answers some of my life's toughest questions, um, and uh, we're excited to, to start this series. I hope that discussions and focus groups and times will be very fruitful for you guys. But it's good to ask questions. And our God is not afraid of your questions, guys. He's not afraid of them. He's there and he's, he, he has answers for us. Um, would you put your hands together and welcome Tyler Core uh, to the King's Academy. Tyler is a pastor to families and students at Family Church downtown. And he's going to ask uh, seek to answer a tough question for us today. So thank you, Tyler. Yeah, thank you, Riley. Hey, it's great to be with you uh, today. This is an exciting time for me because uh, my wife actually grew up at the King's Academy. Her whole family was here. Uh, She started in preschool and then went all the way and graduated from the King's Academy. I grew up in Orlando, and then we met in Alabama at Samford, where we both went to college. And uh, her sister went here and did the same thing. Her name was Ashley Hermy. And her sister's name was Danielle Hermy. It's funny because whenever I talk to teachers who were here during that time, like, oh, Ashley, she's a great student. I loved Ashley. She's amazing. Her sister Danielle was, uh, you know, she was a tough student to have. <laughs> you know, she's a straight A student. She was amazing. She's a little more lively uh, in class, you might say. And uh, so, anyways, I'm really excited to be here. It's such a special place to me. Uh, I serve as the pastor to students and families at Family Church. And so uh, I get to oversee sixth grade through college across all of our campuses. And, uh, man, just absolutely thank the world of King's Academy. Thank the world of so many of you and, uh, and your leaders uh, that you have here. This is a special place. So don't take it for granted. Even in the midst of face mask world and coronavirus and all the difficulties that come along with it, God is still working and moving right here in this place. And uh, I'm actually really excited. I know this is the first week of this question series. This is a phenomenal series because one of the struggles that uh, I know a lot of people have is they've got these questions that you've always wondered in your heart, but you've never had a safe place to ask. Uh, And so a lot of people and a lot of churches, to be quite honest with you, don't leave the door wide open for students to come in and to ask some of life's like really most difficult questions. And uh, and you're scared that maybe you might be judged if you ask them. You're scared somebody might not think that you're a Christian if you ask them. And so what happens to students is you have these questions and you don't ask them. And so what it does is it basically creates this barrier in your heart between like a fully sold out, like, taking up your cross and follow Jesus type of Christian, and instead you kind of build this barrier in your heart between you and God, and these questions just keep building. You never actually search out answers. And so I want to affirm Riley's decision to do this. Um, I do want to say uh, I hope at your church uh, you have the freedom to ask difficult questions because I think the Bible actually gives phenomenal answers, okay? So for the first one, we figured let's go big, let's start strong, and just tackle the question of evil. Why do bad things happen to good people? How can a good God, and you read the Bible, God is loving, and God is so gracious, and God is so good, and he created flowers. So why would he allow coronavirus, and why would he allow genocide? And why would he allow all of these things that are taking place in our world to happen? I think that's a really good question. And so we're going to do our best to tackle it in the next 15 minutes, okay? So this will be a very quick overview, but hopefully it can get the conversation started for all of us. So I want to ask you a question, okay? I'm going to have you answer it to the person to your left or to your right, okay? Here's the question. Do you think your perspective on a situation greatly impacts how you endure that situation. Okay, turn to the person next to you, say yes or no. Do you think your, your perspective actually changes how you perceive and walk through a situation? I didn't have them stand up because the seats would all go poof again, which is hilarious. I love it. All right. Raise your hand if you said yes. I think, I think my, per, my perspective changed. Anybody, anybody say no? Anybody like a little skeptical, a little bit? All right, all right. Some of you are like, I'm bold. I'm going to say no. All right, cool. So here, here's what I want to do. Over the next couple minutes, what my prayer and my hope is simply to help you change your perspective from how you see 
evil and how you see pain and suffering from a worldly perspective to a godly perspective. That's all we're trying to do, okay? Because some of you right now, if you're being honest, some of you are sitting in that sweet spot that I just mentioned, and you've got these questions built up, and maybe this particular question is a big one for you, or maybe you've had some intense pain enter into your life uh, over coronavirus. I mean, the suicide hotlines have been ringing off the roof. Um, domestic abuse and violence has been through the roof. Uh, alcoholism and alcohol abuse has been through the roof. And, uh, and, man, divorce has gone through the roof. So we'd be lying to ourselves to say the people in this room have not been severely impacted over the last seven or eight months by what's been taking place. I'm talking in your home, maybe things that nobody else knows about, and maybe this has gotten to your heart, and this has been a really big issue for you. And you're sitting there thinking, God, I feel like I'm like drowning in like the, the bottom of this mountain, and I've got all these obstacles ahead of me, and I feel like I'm just at the bottom of this giant mountain, I don't know what to do. And the truth is, listen, right in your situation, uh, the book of John tells us that Satan's job is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And in particular, I think he does that to your joy and to your hope and to your peace. He wants to rob you of those three things. And maybe for you, you're at the bottom of the mountain right now, and here's, here's what you're saying. Maybe you're telling yourself, I'll never be happy again. There's your joy. Maybe you're saying, nothing good can come from this. There's your hope. Or maybe you're saying, there's no point in continuing on. What is the purpose of life? There is your purpose. In fact, people have been asking these questions about the problem of evil and suffering for a really long time. And in particular, just like recently, there's been this kind of atheist movement that's taken place. I, I kind of enjoy following because I enjoy having these types of conversations. And uh, they kind of all stem back to their uh, this guy named Epicurus, who's a Greek philosopher, and he kind of coined this phrase, this way of thinking about the problem of evil and God. He's kind of he's kind of an atheist guy himself. And so here, here's what he said. He said, "Listen, is God willing to prevent evil, but not able? In other words, all right, there's going to be another another asking question again. If I gave you a red button, a beautiful red button, right here at the center of the table, and I said, if you hit this button, Macy, you can right now." end all the evil and suffering on the planet. If I said, Gracie Worley, if you came down here and pushed this button, boom, coronavirus wouldn't exist anymore. Boom, injustice, racism. Boom, genocide. Boom, hunger. Boom, all of that would cease to exist and everything evil on the planet would cease to exist in this moment if you hit that button. Would you do it? Go ahead and turn to your friend. Give him a little nod, yes or no. What do you think? Some of you are like, this is a trick question. I don't know where he's going. I feel like I want to say yes. I want to say yes, but I feel like he's tricking me. All right, so what we believe about God, I'm curious. How many of you would push the button? So, okay, all right, about, about half. All right, good. What we believe about God and what Scripture teaches is guess what? He can push that button. He is all-powerful. So here's what Epicurus says. He says, is God willing to prevent evil but not able then he's not an all-powerful God. Is he able to do it, but he's not willing, then he's not a loving God. In other, wo in other words, our God doesn't like get brokenhearted over evil or over suffering or over the pain that you're enduring. That's what he's saying. And of course, we know that that's not true. He says, is he both able and willing, then why does evil exist? In other words, if God is all-powerful and can push the button, and in his heart, he wants to push the button, then why does evil still exist? God must not exist. And is he neither able nor willing, then why call him God? Because if he's not all-powerful and he's not all-loving, then he's certainly not God. And this is something that has plagued people for a really long time. In fact, one of the leading atheists right now that I follow, I listen to his podcast all the time, his name is Sam Harris. And uh, this is something that, that kind of falls right in his wheelhouse in this line of thinking. And to be honest, I've talked with a lot of atheists. I've known a lot of atheists. And I don't know, you know, I know it's a Christian school, but truth is there's probably somebody in here who's sitting here like, man, I'm struggling, and I don't know that I believe in God. And I'll just say this, for most of the atheists who I've known in my life, very few are what I call, I don't know if you experienced this right, very few are what I call intellectual atheists. In other words, very few of them have actually looked at all the reasoning and read the scriptures and different forms of thought and concluded that there must not be a God. In fact, 
in my lifetime, the atheists that I've met, most of them were Christians at one point. Or their parents were Christians. And they got hurt by a Christian. They went to church and nobody talked to them. Uh, they trusted a pastor who ended up hurting them. Or their parents uh, were living this kind of like artificial Christian life. And they'd read in the scriptures that like, this is something worth giving all of your heart for. And they just didn't see that represented in their own home. And so they thought this just must not be real. And so as a result, they got hurt. And they turn to a different way of thinking in atheism. And so uh, whatever it is, uh, this problem of evil and suffering has been an excuse or legitimate, legitimate concern for people to claim atheism. And so for you, maybe it's, man, why would God allow the coronavirus to happen? Why would God allow my grandmother to pass away? Why would God allow my parents to get divorced? If God is powerful and God is good, then why do bad things happen? All right. I want to read uh, a scripture passage to you out of Hebrews 11, uh, starting in verse 32. This is good. This gets me fired up right here. This is like a, like a locker room speech, all right? Uh, verse 32 says, and what more shall I say? He's talking about all the victories of, like, Christ, of, of, of people throughout history who are following God. For time would fail me if I told you about Gideon and Barak, not Obama, Samson, Jephthah of David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith they conquered kingdoms and enforced justice and obtained promises and stopped the mouths of lions. That sounds cool. I want to do that. Not TKA lions. Quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, and they became mighty in war, and they put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead from the resurrection. And you can feel people start to stand up like, yeah, that's what my God does. Ain't nothing that my God can't do. And then the tone totally shifts. And watch what he says next. He's just described all the incredible victories and the power of God. And then watch how this changes. He says, but some were tortured. <laughs> what? Refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, and of whom the world is not worthy, wandering about in the deserts and mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. So, what we see in Scripture is that God does some incredible things through some incredible people. At the same time, we also see a tremendous amount of suffering for the glory of God. And so there's a lie, and it's a myth to think, if I'm a Christian, there shouldn't be any evil or pain in my life. In fact, Scripture actually teaches the opposite. If you are a Christian, uh, people are going to persecute you because of me, and you are going to have pain and struggle and strife in your life because of, uh, of Christ who's in you. And that's okay. So, Here's what I want to do. I want to, based off that and a couple other passages, I want to give you just a couple things to remember when you find yourself at the bottom of a mountain looking up, thinking, God, where are you in this moment, okay? And then we'll kind of tie it all together at the end in just a second. So what do you do at the bottom of the mountain? First thing I want to encourage you to do is to remember God's character, okay? Remember God's character. Just a couple of things about God's character, Scripture says. God is eternal. God's a good father. He's a gracious Lord, he's a just judge, he's a holy God, he's a loving king, he's a merciful master, he's a sovereign savior, and God is a patient Lord. So, if you're a Christian, let me tell you, based off scripture, what you should believe. Just kind of general principles that you can cling to a little bit, okay? Uh, as a Christian, you believe that God is not absent. In other words, God is near to you. There's a, a promise in Philippians, God is near to you. If you're a Christian, God is dwelling inside of you. So you're never alone. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil wine because God is with me. So God's not absent. The second thing is God's not apathetic. In other words, God didn't just spin the world up in motion as a lot of people believe and then walk away and think, all right, well, let's just, let's just see what happens in my simulated video game. Uh, that's not true. God is not apathetic. God cares deeply, and he even has every hair on your head numbered, and he knows everything about your life. 
So God's not absent, he's not apathetic, and God's not angry. Okay? A lot of people uh, that I talk to, I'm just surprised because they have this picture of God as this, like, dude with a trident in his hand who's just waiting to cast down thunderbolts uh, on people. I remember one time walking into a church with an atheist friend that I had invited. He walked with me, and his face turned red. He started sweating. And I was like, dude, what is your deal? And he's like, I just feel like, I've never been to church before, and I just feel like the roof is going to fall in. Like, I just feel like God is going to get me. Like, I don't deserve to be in here. I'm like, listen, man, God's not, he's not just angry at you. God loves you. And so we need to understand that we don't just serve this angry God who's looking to punish people every chance that he gets. So you got to remember God's character. Number two, you got to remember God's providence. This is important. God is sovereign and God is in control and God is working, as Macy said, everything out for our good and for his glory. Here's something you need to understand. God has established eternity as the ultimate equalizer. Okay? I like the way I said that. God has established eternity as the ultimate equalizer. Listen to Ecclesiastes. This is Solomon. He says in chapter 8, 14, he says, And this is not all that is meaningless in our world. In this life, good people are often treated as though they were wicked, and wicked people are often treated as though they were good. In other words, Solomon is looking around the world and saying, this just doesn't make sense. Like there's bad guys that are winning and there's good guys that are dying and losing and it just doesn't seem to make sense. And so here's what he concludes in Ecclesiastes 12. This is important. Uh, We'll jump to the second part of this verse. He says, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it's good or evil. In other words, there is going to come a day where Good is rewarded and evil is punished. Where all the injustices are wiped away and are accounted for. And just because it's not happening right now in front of you doesn't mean that it's not eventually going to happen. God leverages eternity as the ultimate equalizer in the day when there will be ultimate and eternal justice. Another point, God turns symbols of suffering into symbols of salvation. I like this. This is pretty cool. So there's this story in Numbers chapter 21, get this, where uh, the Israelites had like turned from God and they were sinning everything, and so God actually sends poisonous snakes, okay, how about that? (laughs) And uh, and they start biting people, and when people bite, bite, when they get bit by them, they they die, the poisonous snake. And so they finally cry out to God, like, God, help us, what do we do? And God says, here's what I want you to do, I want you to uh, get a staff, and I want you, uh, and I basically want people to look at it, and when they look at it, if they believe that I can heal them, they'll be healed right when they look at it, okay? It was this symbol of healing. And so fast forward thousands of years later, and here's the international symbol for medicine and for healing, which is derived from this. God took a terrible moment for the Israelites and grasped this symbol of suffering and turned it into a symbol of salvation. He's done the same thing with the cross, hasn't he? This horrible torture tool that Jesus was crucified on now many of you are wearing around your necks and it's a sign of salvation that God is with you and he's there for you God wants to turn whatever you're going through right now to help somebody else God wants to recycle your pain he wants to recycle your suffering and so God uses whatever you're going through he wants to use it down the road to help somebody else your parents are going through a divorce Man, I think he's going to put people in your life in the future who you can help walk through that. Somebody close to you passed away, he's going to put people in your life to help you walk through that. God wants to give purpose to your pain, okay? But if he's going to do that, you have to have a godly perspective. So I'm I'm going to wrap it up. Watch this. Uh, I mentioned the worldly perspective of suffering. Um, When people who aren't followers of Jesus have suffering in their life, here's what they experience. Uh, Anger, resentment, depression, quitting. Maybe they turn to self-harm and drunkenness. But watch what James says. Here's how Christians are supposed to interpret pain and suffering. Watch this. Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, but endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete 
lacking nothing. So a Christian interprets pain and suffering as training and equipping and sharpening and maturing an opportunity to pursue holiness. Not that God has caused the evil and suffering in your life, but he wants to leverage it for your maturity in faith. So at the bottom of the mountain, you need to understand I can be happy again. You need to cling to the joy. You need to know something good can come from this. There's your hope. And you've got to understand there is purpose in my pain. There is your purpose. And the last thing is I want to encourage you to be grateful to God for his patience, okay? Is God all loving? Yes. Is God all powerful? Could he hit this button? Absolutely he could. But why hasn't he done it yet? Scripture says because you've left out the third part to God's character, which is that he's patient. He's a patient God. Look at this verse. As I finish, 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness, but he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So why hadn't God pushed the red button? I think because he's waiting. I think because he's waiting on you. He's waiting on a friend. He's waiting on somebody to give their life to Jesus. And if you hadn't done that, I hope you'll do that today. Let me pray. And then uh, we'll dismiss. God, we love you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We know you're a loving God. We uh, just ask anybody in this room who's not given their life to you and trusted you with their eternity, I pray that they would feel free to do that today. God, we love you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys are dismissed. See you.